Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Peter Lorre in an episode of Mystery in the Air from September 11th, 1947. An adaptation of the Alexander Pushkin story, The Queen of Spades. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. <laughs> But, Countess, are you sure you want to put all your winnings on a single card? Absolutely sure, my dear Duke. Well, I don't know how it is in Russia, but here in Paris, it is very seldom that anyone wins on three cards in succession. The game of Faro is the same in Russia as anywhere else. But I wish to put the whole amount, 400,000 francs, on my next card. As you wish, madame. I will deal. I have won. No. Look, I have won. See, Duke, you were wrong. Yes, I was wrong. I... Heavens, what's the matter? Each week at this time... Camel cigarettes bring you Peter Lorre in the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin. The story I'm about to tell you, you may not believe, but I assure you it actually happened. Now, the whole thing started one night when a group of young officers were having a game of cards at the rooms of Narumov of the Horse Guard. There were five of us there, including a lieutenant in the engineers named Hermann. He was the son of a German who had become a naturalized Russian, and he was an ambitious young man of strong passions and imagination, which he held in check by an even stronger will. Thus, though a born gambler at heart, Hermann never touched a card, for he considered his financial position did not allow it. Oh, I remember that night. At about four in the morning, we all sat down to supper. Oh, I'm not hungry. <laughs> <laughs> How did you make out, Surin? Ah, uh, I lost. You always lose, Surin. You must be very strong-minded to be so consistent. <laughs> well, <it's wrong. laughs> if you think he is strong-minded, how about yourself, Herman? Yes. Me? Why me? Uh, you never held a card in your hand or made a bet. <laughs> and yet you sit here until four o'clock in the morning watching us play. <laughs> well, Tomsky, you see, gambling interests me. It interests me very much. In fact, I, I'm a gambler at heart, but I'm not in a financial position to sacrifice the necessary in a hope for winning the superfluous. In other words, I cannot afford it. <laughs> well, that doesn't explain anything. We none of us can afford it. Oh, Hermann's easy enough to understand. He's of German de descent, therefore he's thrifty. Right. Now, it's my grandmother, the Countess Fedotovna, who baffles me. You know, she won't gamble either. Oh, lots of grandmothers don't gamble. St. Petersburg is full of them. Ah, yes, <laughs> but they don't know the secret my grandmother knows. Huh? Secret? What kind of secret does she know? Something we'd all of us give a lot to possess. Huh? Yeah, a combination of three cards that can't fail to win at the faro table. Hmm? Oh, there's no such thing. What are you trying to tell us? Oh, let's go home. It's wait, late. Wait, wait, Tomsky, I'd like to know more about this secret. <laughs> what do you care, Herman? I mean, you don't gamble. Still, I'd like to hear about it. All right. Many years ago, when my grandmother was a lot younger... She went to Paris. Oh, she must have been quite a sensation. The Muscovite Venus, they called her. Anyway, she gambled at Faro with the Duke of Orléans. Lost a great deal of money, much more than she could pay. Yeah, who does? Come on, keep quiet, will you? <laughs> well, there was at that time a Count Saint-Germain in Paris. Yes. A mysterious figure that no one knew much about. Well, be that as it may, he revealed to my grandmother the secret of the three winning cards. Huh? And did she win? Ah, 
That night, she played again with the Duke d'Orléans. Yes. Played the three cards, one after the other, doubling her bet each time. And all three won, and she recovered everything she had lost ten times over. Oh, oh a little hard on the Duke, don't you think? Oh, yes, as a matter of fact, he dropped dead, I believe. It was a long time ago. Come on, come on, Tomsky, go on with the story. Well, that's all there is. My grandmother never touched a card again. You mean she knows how to pick three winning cards in succession, and you haven't succeeded in getting the secret out of her? <laughs> that's the devil of it. She had four sons, one of whom was my father, and yet she would never reveal the secret to any of them. Though it wouldn't have been a bad thing for them. <laughs> or for you either. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've had enough. I'm going home. Well, I'll go along with you. All right, come along. <laughs> Tomsky, uh, tell me, this grandmother of you is uh, Countess Fedotovna. Does she live in St. Petersburg? Yes, with a ward of hers named uh, Lizaveta. Mm. <laughs> Poor girl, she is supposed to be my grandmother's companion, but slave would be a better word for it. <laughs> Your grandmother's a widow? Yes. Oh, now, don't get your hopes up, Herman. She's a bit too old for you. She's 86 if she's a day. Still, I, I should like to meet her. No, there's not much chance of it, I'm afraid. She doesn't go about much anymore. But I still should like to meet her, yes. I, I should like to meet her very much. Zavieta? Hello, Paul. Don't tell me my grandmother is here. No, but she is going to the embassy ball tomorrow. Tonight, I, I came alone. Oh, oh, oh. While the cat's at home, the mouse will play. Hmm? <laughs> What's this I've been hearing about you? About me? Mm, all very romantic, I understand. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come, 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 Lizavieta. You can't tell me that you don't know about the mysterious officer who's been standing outside the house for the last two weeks. About the notes he hands you when you get into the carriage with my grandmother. About the letters he sends by the milliner's girl. Who told you? <laughs> Great friend of your officer. A lieutenant in the engineers named Herman. Herman? Oh, yes, I, I think I've heard of him. Is he nice? Oh, I like him very much. But he's a very determined young man and means to get what he wants. Personally, I wouldn't trust him. He has the profile of Napoleon and the soul of Mephistopheles. <laughs> oh, good evening, Kamsky. Good evening. Speak of the devil. Hello there, Herman. Uh, Lizavieta, may I present Lieutenant Herman? Mademoiselle. The man we were just talking about. Uh, Herman, this is Lizavieta Ivanovna. It's my grandmother's ward. How do you do, Mademoiselle Lizavieta? How do you do, Lieutenant? Would you like to dance? Yes, I would like to. Good. See you later, Tomsky. Oh, this is paradise, Lizavieta. Holding you in my arms, feeling your heart beat against mine. No, no, you mustn't say things like that. <laughs> People will hear you, they'll talk. I don't care. They're talking already. Why did you make up that story about your imaginary friend to tell Tom's? <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want him to know it was I, and, and I had to talk about you to somebody. I hope the Comtesse doesn't hear about it. Devil with her. It's not the Countess I'm in love with. It's you. Oh, Lizavieta, this... This is so wonderful. It, it makes up for all those nights I stood outside your house and... Look, there in the door. There's the Comtesse's coachman come to fetch oh. me. I must go home. When am I going to see you again? I don't know. Oh, but this is horrible. My heart is burning with things I want to tell you, but I can never, never see you alone. There must be some way. There is a way. Yes, how? Take this. Oh. This is the key to the Contessa's house. Oh, Lizaviet. Tomorrow night, we're going to the embassy ball. We'll be home at two. If you let yourself into the house at about 11.30, all the servants will be asleep. Yes, I will. Go directly to the library. It's at the right end of the corridor at the top of the stairs. Wait for me there. Right end of the corridor. Oh, you sweet Lizavieta. I adore you. Where's the Countess' room? At the other end of the corridor. Why do you ask me that? I don't want to get into the wrong room by mistake. Oh. <laughs> but now I must go. Till tomorrow night at two o'clock. Au revoir, chérie. Mademoiselle, good night.
Good night, my child. Contest, are you sure there's nothing you want me to do for you? No, nothing, thank you, little Vieta. I think I will just put my jewels away and sit quietly a while by myself. Good night. Good night. Uh, I am so tired. So very tired. I am too old to go. <laughs> What's that? Don't be alarmed, madame. Who are you? Please don't be alarmed, Countess. I, I have no intention of harming you, but please. How did you get in my bedroom? I have been waiting behind that curtain, waiting just for a chance to ask you a favor. A favor? Yes. Of me? Yes, a favor of you, madame. You can ensure the happiness of my life. It'll, it'll cost you nothing. I don't know who you are, but you're mad. No, I'm not. I, I happen to know that you can name three winning cards in order. And... Oh, that, uh, that was a joke. No, it was not a joke, oh. Oh, I can see it by your expression, madame. I, madame, I want you to tell me those three winning cards, I do. No, no. But whom are you keeping that secret for, huh? Your grandsons, they are rich enough without it. Besides, they, they don't know the value of money, but I, I do. I, your cards will not be thrown away. Huh? No, no. It is a crest. It brings death. I'll chance that. Of, of what use is it to you? Or is it connected with some terrible sin or, or some bargain with the devil, huh? I'm ready to take your sins upon my soul, only please, please reveal the secret to me. No. Please. What? I... You. You won't catch. I'll make you answer. No, I want no. You. you have my happiness in your hands. No. no. I'll take you to... Let go, you, my soul. You won't speak. I'll no. make you... you... No. I'll... She wouldn't tell me. She, she wouldn't tell me. I'll... Are you all right? I heard voices. Comtesse, is everything... You. Yes, it is I. But I don't understand. Where's the Comtesse? There she is. Comtesse, what's the... It's no use. She... She's dead. Dead? Yes, dead. She's taking with her the one thing I wanted in the world. Without which I, I don't want to face life. You killed her? Yes, but... But you're not going to say anything to you. <gasps> no one knows I was in the house except you. You can't tell because you gave me the key. But you killed her? Yes, yes, I killed her. I killed her. She she deserved to die. But now, now I'll never know her secret. Never. No one, no one will ever know her secret. Of, <laughs> unless she, unless she comes back to, to tell it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> In a few moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's Mystery in the Air. September 11th, 1947, Mystery in the Air on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You know, it's true. Difficult times have a way of focusing us. We have to think about what matters most when it comes to our spending, our health care. No doubt, this is why so many people are joining MediShare right now. MediShare is a trusted way to save up to 50% on your monthly health care costs. More than 400,000 people have already made the switch. It's pretty obvious why, too, especially now during this challenging season with health care costs and out-of-pocket expenses going up. MediShare can save you a lot of money. The typical family saves $500 a month. And MediShare is a Christian health care sharing ministry that's worked beautifully for 29 years. There are different options to choose from to fit your budget. I'll give you the number here in a second. And if you call, you can get a price within two minutes. Maybe now is the perfect time to make the switch and start saving. Here you go. Call 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Mike Lindell and MyPillow offering the BOGO extravaganza right now on a whole slew of MyPillow products. Now you can find all sorts of great deals on MyPillow bed sheets, Giza Elegance MyPillow, Six Pete's Towel Sets, Roll and Go Anywhere Pillows, much more, all priced buy one, get one free. Go to MyPillow.com slash USA, use promo code USA, or call 
8175 and find you some great my pillow products they're all available oh by the way you can also get mike's book absolutely free with any purchase but you have to uh, go to mypillow.com slash usa or call 1-800-951-8175 and make sure you use the promo code the buy one get one extravaganza going on right now at mypillow.com Whether you're taking your pets on the road or a walk around the block, you need to be aware of heat stroke. Hi, I am Dr. Jose Arce, immediate past president of the American Veterinary Medical Association. It's important that pets get out and enjoy the warm weather and fresh air, but here are some reminders to help keep your pets safe in the heat. Tune into the day's forecast to see how hot it will be. Limit exercise on hot days or schedule walks earlier or later on the day when it's cooler. If outside, stay on the grass instead of the hot pavement. Make sure your pet has unlimited fresh water and access to shade. Never leave your pet in a closed vehicle and leave your pet at home in air conditioning when you go out. If you see signs of heat strokes in your pet, such as excessive panting, drooling, unsteadiness or abnormal gum and tongue color, call your veterinarian or nearest emergency clinic. For more info on summer pet safety, visit avma.org. That's avma.org. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Mystery in the Air. The Queen of Spades, September 11th, 1947. So the Countess is dead, and now the funeral is in progress. What a stupendous funeral. The huge church is banked with flowers, all the way from the doors to the catafalque where the coffin rests. And such a distinguished group of mourners. It almost seems as if all Imperial Russia is there. Tomsky. A sad occasion, eh? Yes. Well, I suppose the old girl had to go sooner or later. No, oh, there were times when I doubted she ever would. Uh, what'd she die of? A heart attack, they said. Why? Oh, I've heard rumors. Uh, you know how those things are. Something about bruises on her throat. Oh, no, no. No, nothing to it, no. The doctor said she could have inflicted those herself when oh? she had trouble breathing. Hello, Tomsky. My condolences. Oh, thank you for coming, Herman. That's very nice of you. You never met my grandmother, did you? No, I didn't, but uh, that's no reason I shouldn't show my respect. After all, you're my friend. I beg your pardon, but would you gentlemen care to view the remains before the services commence? I suppose I should, anyway. Oh, yes, by all means. I'll come, too, if, uh, if you don't mind. Not at all. Thank you. Come along. Doesn't she look peaceful? Poor old girl, I was fond of her. Wait. Wait, did you see that? Huh? See what? Look, one of her eyelids moved. What? I tell you... Come on, be quiet. But I saw it. Her her eyelids moved as as if she winked at me. As if she... She winked. He's fainting. A fine example of an army officer. Fainting at a funeral. No, maybe he's sick. Come on, help me carry him out of here. I shall never get to sleep. My my conscience won't let me. Oh, why did I do it? Why why did I go to that cursed funeral just just because my conscience said you are the murderer of that old woman? I I wanted to implore her pardon, but but she winked at me. I, I could swear it she did. <laughs> Who's there? Who, who, who? You do not recognize me. Uh, you have a short memory. Count as if I have uh, come back from the beyond against my wishes. Huh? I have been ordered to grant your request. Grant my request? Yes. Three, seven, and eight will win for you, if played in succession. Three, seven, and an ace. But only on these conditions. Anything, anything at all. you do not play more than one card in 24 hours, and that you never play cards again during the rest of your life. All right, 
I promise, I promise. Three, seven, and an ace. <laughs> Three, seven, and an ace. Oh, I must remember it. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, ace. <laughs> Are you all right? All right. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, all right. Yes, I'm all right. Oh, that's good. We were worried about you. We hadn't seen you since you collapsed at my grandmother's funeral. Oh, oh, oh. that was terrible, Lieutenant. And an officer shouldn't faint. I, I hope you'll forgive me for what happened yesterday. Oh, that's all right. Could have happened to anyone. Oh. But it wasn't yesterday, you know. Hmm? It was the day before. The day before? Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> you must have been pretty sick to lose a whole day like that. What got into you? Tromsky, uh... Will you do me a favor? Uh -huh. If I can, what is it? I've heard a lot about a certain Chikolinsky and, uh, and a gambling that goes on at his house every oh, night. Oh, yes. And... Chikolinsky has practically spent his whole life at the card table. That's what I heard. Oh, he's amassed millions at it, but what... I should like to go there. Oh, you want to watch them play Faro at Chikolinsky? No, I want to play. You want to play? Yes. <laughs> What's happened to you, Herman? I thought you couldn't afford to gamble. Yes, but now I can. I, You see, I... I have a little legacy left uh, from my father. And Congratulations. I feel I'm in luck. Uh, when can you take me? Any time. Tonight? Yes, yes, if you feel up to it. Good, that's very good. <laughs> we'll go to Chekolinsky's tonight, huh? Tomsky, honestly, I... Oh, I've never seen such a magnificent establishment. Never, never in my life have I seen such a place. It's... Well, it's all paid for by fellows like you who felt they were in luck. <laughs> Look, there's Chukalinsky at the faro table. Where? Oh. Come on over, I'll introduce you. But don't say I didn't warn you. Good evening. Good evening, Tomsky. Um, Chukalinsky, hmm? I want you to meet a friend of mine, Lieutenant Herman. Uh, Herman? This is the famous Chekalinsky. Good evening. Enchanté. Uh, Herman seems to feel particularly fortunate tonight. Do you suppose he could sit in and take a card? A friend of yours? <laughs> but of course. Good luck, Herman. Thanks. Will you be kind enough to select your card, please? Thank you. This is my card. And how much would you like to bet, Lieutenant? I would like to bet 47,000 rubles. <laughs> Forgive me, Lieutenant, but we only play for cash. It's quite all right. I, I have it. Money's right here. Are you crazy, Herman? You're playing pretty high, Lieutenant. Nobody here has ever staked anything like that on one card before. Well, do you accept it or don't you? I accept it. Then if you'll be kind enough to deal. As you wish. Nine. Three. Herman has one. One. Look, his card is a three. Well, congratulations, Lieutenant. Uh, do you want me to settle with you now? If you please. Uh, here you are. September 11th, 1947, Peter Lorre starring in The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin, an episode of Mystery in the Air. The conclusion follows these words on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. America's Protestants, Catholics, and Jews are strengthening the bonds of brotherhood and friendship by helping the needy overseas. Through their houses of worship, these three faiths are sending voluntary relief to virtually every free country in the world. Hundreds of millions of pounds of goods, clothing, and medicine will go to victims of war, disaster, and famine in many parts of the world. More than 80% of American voluntary relief work for the hungry and needy overseas is conducted through the religious agencies of these three major faith groups. When you share with needy persons overseas through your house of worship, you are promoting the spirit of democracy that unites all peoples for peace and goodwill. You are keeping faith with the finest tradition and heritage of America. CBS Radio urges you to keep faith with those in need overseas by giving as much as you can through your faith. People in free countries abroad, no matter what their current image of our nation may be, are curious to know more about America and Americans. The printing presses of the Soviet Union are working at full speed to make sure that the picture they get of the United States is a slanderous one, a distorted view of our nation and its citizens. The range of books distributed by the communists throughout the free world is enormous, and their sheer volume staggering. 
there is something you can do as an individual to make sure that students and interested readers are able to learn the truth about us through a program called Books from America. Take a look at your bookshelves. If you have American literary classics, recent American histories or geographies, modern English grammars and language study texts, these in good condition and hard bound, you can help combat communist propaganda. Mail them to Books from America, Box 1960, Washington 13, D.C. That's Books from America, Box 1960, Washington 13, D.C. If you're a teenage or up, a loyal American, male or female, your country needs you in the Civilian Ground Observer Corps. You've heard the radio broadcasts, seen the television pictures. You know the facts. You know what a single H-bomb dropped in any metropolitan area could do. And today's long-range bombers have made intercontinental war possible. Enemy planes based on the other side of the world could reach the United States in a matter of hours. Radar can help detect them, but there are dangerous gaps through which low-flying planes can penetrate without detection. To fill out our detection system, civilian personnel is needed, particularly along the east and west coasts and in the northern states. Sky watching is not a game, it's a necessary precaution. The Ground Observer Corps is now operating on a 24-hour-a-day basis and needs at least 200,000 volunteers to contribute a few hours of their spare time to this vital work. Will you volunteer? Get in touch with your local civilian defense center at once. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of Mystery in the Air, an adaptation of the Alexander Pushkin story, The Queen of Spades, as it was originally broadcast September 11th, 1947. 47,000 rubles. No, 47,000. Would you like to try again? No, not tonight, but tomorrow night I'll be back to try another card. Well, Lieutenant, what do you want to wager tonight? Same stake as last night, plus my winnings, 94,000 rubles. Just as you say. You have picked your cards. I will deal. Knave, seven. Look, look, Herman's won again. The card is seven. There you are. 94,000 rubles. Thank you, sir. I shall see you again tomorrow night. Here I don't believe he'll show up if you're fooling him. Here he comes now, with Thompson. Now, he can't win three times in a row. He just impossible. Gentlemen, gentlemen, quiet, please. Well, Lieutenant Herman, how much do you wish to bet tonight? Same stake, plus my winnings. Here it is. 180,000 rubles. What? On one card? Yes. Oh, Herman, don't you think that... that... Please be quiet, Tom Scan. Know what I'm doing. Gentlemen, please. Will you choose your card, Lieutenant? I have it. Will you please deal? Queen. Ace. <laughs> I win again. Ace wins. Here it is. Huh? If you'd been holding an ace, you would have won. But you haven't an ace. You have a queen, and it loses. Well, what do you mean? What I... <laughs> you, you weren't holding an ace, my dear fellow. You have the queen of spades. Queen? Look. Look queen at it yourself. Queen of spades? What? It is impossible. I have... Uh... Yes, it is. Yes, it is the queen of spades. Huh? <laughs> now I see it, but... Look at... Oh, it... It isn't the Queen of Spades. It's the Countess. Look, see the resemblance? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, she's tricked me. She's deliberately tricked me. What are you talking about? Your grandmother. Your grandmother, the Countess. She told me three, seven, and eight. She told you? Yes, she oh, did. you never met her. I did meet her. I waited for her one night in her bedroom, and I pleaded with her. But she refused to tell me. She refused to tell me her secret. And then I took her by the throat. And you killed her, huh? You took her by the throat and yes, strangled her. Yes, I killed her, yes, but she didn't tell me that. But then one night she came back, 
She came back from the grave and she told me three cards. It was seven. And I don't know about you, but she lied. She lied to me. Oh, that dirty woman. She's got no revenge. I, I've lost all the money I had in the world, but I, I don't care anymore. But I'll, right, I'll, I'll show her. Let go. I'll, 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 you murder the cousin. You'll hang for that. Let them hang me. Let them hang me. I'll get even with her. Beyond the grave, I'll get even with her. I'll be glad when they hang me. I'll be glad when they hang me. But they didn't hang him. He is spending the rest of his life in room 17 of the Obukhov Hospital. He never answers any question, but constantly Three, mutters the same seven, thing. Eight. Three, seven, eight. Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Henry Morgan, Lorene Tuttle, Peggy Weber, Ben Wright, Louis Van Ruten, Stanley Waxman, Jack Edwards Jr., and Rolf Sedan. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night. September 11th, 1947, Mystery in the Air on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. It's a big, bold story set in the heartland of America, along the edge of Lonely Mountain. I am open for business. And so Big William Gorgon, played by handsome Michael James, fiercely set down his Midwest roots. Oh, darling, we're going to sell bathrobes and raise chickens. Set as adoring wife, Wilhelmina, portrayed by beautiful Glenda Olson. Oh, I love our store, Will. But they hadn't counted on Big Ralph's bathrobes and cattle store coming to town. Oh, Will, Will, what will we do, Will? Will had a plan, a way of facing off against tough Big Ralph. We're going to change the face of America. We're going to advertise. Ad for what? The print broadcasting and bus benches are going to tell people who we are and where we are. What's a bus? And so the story of how one man brought advertising to the heartland. Oh, Will, will it work? It will. Well, my name ain't Will, Philomena. you got to advertise or we'll die. And so the greatest marketing story of all time is here. Advertise or die, dopey. Put your message on this national advertising platform. Email classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Radio. Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream for the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. You the maraschino cherry. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 27 inches, yes. She was born in a humble shack amidst the lemon groves of Goleta, California. Mommy, you don't cry, you know what they say? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I was going to say, life sucks, and then you die. But I like yours better. And with that, Alexandra Johnson launched her lemonade stand. Lemonade, make a glass. Every day, even during the frigid California winters, a bone-chilling 72 degrees, you could find her. Never sour, you never tweet. Little girl's lemonade will knock you off your feet. The little girl with the sour brew wanted more. National distribution franchises, and so she rolled out a well-budgeted advertising campaign. Me and the rest of the dock workers only drink a little girl lemonade. She was made president of the International Sour Drink Association and chosen to give the keynote speech at their convention. You all sat with words of wisdom, honey? You know what they say, Mommy. Always advertise so consumers think of your product first? I was going to say never swallow a lemon seed or a watermelon on your tummy. This fabricated but interesting story is to remind you that it's called advertising and it works. Put your message on this national advertising platform by emailing classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com.
Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part two of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Confidential Matter. This originally broadcast September 11th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Mac Woodson, Mr. Dollar. The girl from the claims office called and uh, gave me this number. Oh, yes, Mr. Woodson. It seems we're working on the same case for the same company. Well, I've been working on Mr. Ed Morgan's files and records here for the past week now. I've turned up some... How much is missing? Well, about $80,000 so far. All of it was taken during the four months immediately preceding his death. I'll, I'll say one thing. In 20 years as an accountant, I've never seen a looting more cleverly carried out. Oh, Ed was a very bright lad. A man who'd go far, they all said. Did uh, you know him, Mr. Dollar? I thought I did. He was one of my best friends. But it turns out I'm only beginning to know him. Could you meet me in his office around 10 o'clock, Mr. Woodson? Yes, yes, that's where I am now. I've been working on these books day and night. Better be careful. That's what got Ed into trouble. Uh, How's that? Tonight, and every weekday night... Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the home office, Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Confidential Matter. Location, San Francisco. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item four, one dollar, one martini. Item five, one dollar, one tip to the bartender who stirred the martini. All in the house that Jack built. I don't know who built it, actually. But it took Jack to live in it. Twelve hundred bucks a month, to be exact. That was the take-home bite for an apartment at the Drakeley Arms on Knob Hill. And, of course, that didn't include drinks in the intimate little private bar just off the lobby. And this is where Ed Morgan had lived during the last five months of his life, until he missed a curve one night and drove his car off a cliff into the Pacific. Ed Morgan, whose idea of a big night had always been his pipe, slippers, and a mystery novel. But things were different when I'd known him and been his friend. For one thing, he hadn't stolen $80,000. Or I don't think he had. Do you find the martini adequate to your expectations, sir? Oh, yeah. Yeah, indeed. It's a heck of a belt for a buck. Thank you, sir. Quite a nice little place you got here. Oh, I find it a most agreeable sanctuary from the stress and strife and the hurly-burly of the city. Been here long? I have tended by here in the Drakeley Arms Rendezvous for some two years now. Oh, well, then you may have known a friend of mine who had an apartment here uh, up until a month ago. A uh, Mr. Edward Morgan? Oh, yes. Mr. Morgan was a regular customer here. An eager supplicant for my humble and healing wares. A beer drinker, mostly, as I recall. Uh, The rendezvous does not serve beer, sir. Oh, forgive me. I didn't know. Quite all right, sir. Yes, I was here before Mr. Morgan moved in, and here I am still, now that he is no longer with us. Such is the chance and mystery of life. (sighs) One just never knows. Precisely. Oh, could I send you Not yet, thanks. Get to know Ed pretty well, did you? Mm, The policy of the Drakeley Arms, sir, is to maintain a certain degree of formality in relations between guests and personnel. (laughs) Sort of like a zoo, you might say, with bars to separate the people from the animals. (laughs) The comparison is quite apt. Somehow I can't see Ed Morgan sanking in in a marble squirrel cage like this, John. Mm, I confess, I... He hardly seemed the type to me, sir. He was much too unrestrained for the Drakeley. He came in here a lot, did he? Almost nightly. For a few minutes, at least, on his way to some gala night spot. Gala night spot? Ed Morgan? Oh, yes. In all the years I knew Ed, I was only able to drag him into a gala night spot once. He stayed 20 minutes, then left because his tie was choking. Are you quite certain that your friend was the same Ed Morgan? (sighs) I wish I weren't. Who were his friends? Did he always come in alone? Oh, no. No, never alone, sir. He and Nicky were inseparable. Nicky? Oh, I should say, of course, Mrs. Barrett. Oh, a young widow, as I remember. Lives here in the building. A lovely girl. Fascinating. And also unrestrained? Definitely. And Ed then was one of her friends. Oh, they were together every night, sir. An hour here in our little establishment, a few champagne cocktails, then out to dinner, dancing, the opera, ballet. Ed Morgan? Oh, quite. 
Life was just a mad whirl for those two. I gather your friend was something of a wealthy playboy. He was a claims adjuster for an insurance company. Hmm, then uh, how could he possibly live in the fashion he did? If I told you, you'd flip. I beg your pardon? Tell me something. Was Ed in here on the night he was killed? Oh, yes, yes. He left here about uh, nine, as I recall. And a few hours later, he was dead. How did this Nikki take it? Pretty broken up, was she? Uh, she is a woman of very strong character. Huh. In other words, she didn't ban an eye. Uh, well, I Look, wouldn't... that night Ed was killed. Did he leave here alone? No, sir. He was alone when he went off the cliff. Not when he left here, though. Nikki was with him. Item six, two dollars and forty cents. Taxi to the Telegraph Hill apartment of Lisa Duval. Lisa had been Ed Morgan's secretary for about four years. But it seemed Miss Mousy business at the office was Miss North Beach Bohemia at home. Italian slacks and halter. Cushions on the floor. And naturally a view of the Bay Bridge from a corner window. We sat on the floor, naturally, and drank Chianti from a half-gallon jug while a record player moaned agonizedly under the gouging of its needle. Bartok, I gathered, was now last year's kick. This was progressive jazz. Maybe that seems a little affected to you, Mr. Dollar. The way I dress and live in private life, as you might say. Why so? Everybody's got a right to salt his own dish of porridge the way he likes it. Well, I've done this deliberately, I guess, as a sort of antidote for the insurance business. Oh, has it been that bad? Not bad. Boring. Oh, not your end of it, of course. Investigation work must be exciting. Yes, yeah, scream a minute, day and night. But just keeping records, filing papers week after week. I used to stare out of the office window at the ships in the harbor and think about stowing away on one. But, of course, I didn't have the nerve. Mm, too bad. The crews would have been delirious. I thought of quitting several times. I guess I stayed because of Ed, Mr. Morgan. Oh? He was always so wonderful to work for, so lenient and understanding, up until the last few months, at least. What about those last few months, Lisa? What came over him? I don't know. He was different, that's all. As though he were tense and nervous, under pressure. Any idea where the pressures came from? He didn't confide in me, Mr. Dollar. What, uh, what were your personal relations between the two of you during the years you worked for him? What do you mean? Well, I mean, were you friendly, formal, strictly business? Friendly, I think, would cover it best. Did you see each other outside of office hours? Occasionally. I notice one of his pipes there in the bookcase. He... Come here sometimes in the evening, and we'd listen to music and talk. Up until the... Until the last few months? It wasn't that we stopped being friends, Mr. Dollar. He was... he was just different, that's all. Tense, under pressure. That's about the only way I can describe it. But you don't know why he was that way. Well, looking back, I suppose it was because of the money. If he really did take it. I just... I just can't believe it. Ed wasn't that kind of a man. He was gentle and honest, at least until... Until the last few months? Yes. Or were you going to say, until she came along? How did you... Lisa. Yes? How long have you been in love with Ed? Ever since I started to work for him. But he never knew it. He couldn't even see me. I'm sorry, Lisa. I'm sorry for you, too, Mr. Dollar. I know how close you and Ed were. And I know how you must feel being called in and having... Forget it. It's a job, that's all. Sure, just a job. So is major surgery. This woman he was going around with, Nikki Barrett. Did you ever meet her? I met her. Well, what did you think? What's the difference? I was prejudiced. I'll allow for that. In the old days, they used to believe in witches, vampires... Some of them were very beautiful, and they'd lure a man on and on, and then destroy him. And you think she did something like that to Ed? No, you weren't out this way during the time he knew her. You weren't around him to see how he'd changed. No, no. Oddly enough, the one time I was through here about three months ago, Ed was unexpectedly called away on business. He wasn't called away. He was avoiding you. He knew he was getting in too deep. How'd he meet her? She came to the office with a life insurance claim, $50,000. 
Her husband had just died. I knew her type from the minute she walked in. The grieving widow, all in black, and looking like a Powers model. And he just melted down and laid his head under her foot. That was the start of it. Well, why'd she come to him? Unless she had a disputed claim. It was a double indemnity clause. Her husband had been killed in an accident. Her husband, too, huh? What do you mean? Ed Morgan died in an accident. Remember? Item seven, a dollar and fifteen cents taxi from Lisa's apartment to the Deckman building on Montgomery Street. It was after ten and the financial district was nearly deserted. The canyons between the tall buildings were hollow and empty. A cold wind was blowing off the bay. Or maybe it was blowing out of the past. An old, old past, dead and far away. The pattern was beginning to look familiar. Too familiar. Lord, the woman gave me the forbidden apple to eat. Ed, too, it seemed. The same old wine, the same old dodge. And yet there was something not quite right about that pattern. The cotton runs into some funny ones, Mr. Dollar. This Morgan case here is one of them. How do you mean, Mr. Woodson? Well, the way he was going about it, for one thing. Running hog wild, as you might say. Of course, as I said on the phone, his general scheme was pretty clever. He certainly knew standard procedures. Well, he'd been with the company a long time. Well, now, these uh, payoff checks on claims, of course, they were sent out from Hartford in care of this office. So what Morgan did was open a disbursement account in the bank here, then sign and deposit the checks and draw out the money in cash chargeable to direct disbursement funds under his own name. Mr. Woodson... Now, of course, the canceled checks would return to Hartford, but... Since they were countersigned to disbursement, they wouldn't even be processed. Instead, they'd be returned to Morgan. So, you see, there'd be no evidence in Hartford... Mr. Woodson, I'll accept the fact that Ed was clever. But what did you mean there was something funny in the way he was going about it? Well, he must have known it couldn't last. It was a good scheme for a short time, but it carried the seeds of its own destruction. In what way? Complaints. Some of these claims are four months old and legitimate claims. Morgan couldn't stall these people off forever. Oh, I see. Only other embezzlement case I've worked on that was similar was a man who worked a quick swindle for a blackmail payoff. He knew he'd probably get caught, but he just had to take the chance. Yeah, you may have stumbled onto something, Mr. Woodson. Oh, is that so? Uh, you mean it ties in with that file folder you've been studying there? Eh? Oh, I don't know. It's an investigation report on an accidental death happened about a year ago. Ed Morgan handled the insurance claim and got to know the widow. He'd been running around with her for several months just before his death. Well, don't... Quite see the con- Oh, oh, of course. Mr. Morgan also died in an accident. Unless he was murdered. Now, here is our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, $80,000 and a beautiful girl, both missing. Then one of the two is found and a bombshell explodes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Hugh Brundage speaking. September 11th, 1956. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for tuning in. Would you thank this station and support their advertisers? It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time you roll around here on your favorite station. Now, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available on demand by going to classicradio.stream. That is classicradio.stream. At classicradio.stream, you can stream all of our shows on demand. There's also a list of podcast sites where you can hear our shows also. There is also uh, information on building a classic radio collection of your own. Uh, All of our social media links are there. And if if you're so inclined, you can buy me a coffee. No, I don't drink coffee. 
but that to buy me a coffee link if, or whatever you buy in there or whatever you put in there, it goes to help us expand our classic radio theater uh, a collection of shows that we can bring you. That's all at classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. <laughs>